there, say amen. 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 All right. How many of you got an outline tonight? Anybody not get an outline? Raise your hand if you didn't get one. Uh, we'll get these uh, ran around to you here very quickly here. And uh, just have a couple verses we're going to look at in our study uh, from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter number 5 uh, tonight. And uh, this has been an enjoyable book of the Bible. It's a book of hope, and I've enjoyed studying through it. Um, and so we'll pick up our study here this evening here in chapter 5, verses, excuse me, verses 14 and 15. Now, going back to the beginning of this epistle, at the beginning, Paul had commended the Thessalonian church for being a church uh, that uh, was very faithful through all kinds of difficulty. If you remember, Paul went and God used him to establish the church. He was only there for about three weeks, and he was chased out of town because of persecution. But the believers there who got saved remained faithful even through the persecution they were enduring. And so he commended them for that. And then when we get to chapter 4, he transitions from his commendation and begins to challenge them. And he challenges them to keep growing. And he challenges them in several areas that they need to keep growing in holiness and in love and in hope. And uh, as, he, as he goes through this challenge, then he begins to speak about what the great reason is for them to keep growing and to have this hope. And that is because Jesus is coming. Uh, the rapture is coming and Christ is going to come again. And the end of this world is going to take place. And all of these things were inspiring and challenging for the church. So this is the foundation upon which the end of this epistle is built on. And now we come to the end. And at the end of this letter that Paul wrote to the church, he begins to give them a lot of practical instruction about how they can keep growing and how they can remain faithful until Jesus comes again. Um, and so as Paul concludes the letter, he gives this practical instruction to the saints about how they're supposed to conduct themselves until Jesus comes. Now, last week, we looked at the first area of practical instruction and he gave, that he gave to them, and that was instruction about how uh, the pastor and the people are to respond to the ministry of the pastor. Now, the pastor is supposed to conduct himself, and now the people are supposed to respond to the ministry of the pastor. And now in our text today, we move on and we find a, a series of principles that teach us really how to act towards others in the church and even how to act towards those without the church. Uh, those who are not a part of the church. You'll know, hear the words of the scripture here together in verse 14 of chapter 5, where the Bible says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, and see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. And uh, as we open the scriptures and study this text, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Father, we come before you again tonight. We ask that you will still our hearts and minds and get us ready to receive the truth that you have for us this evening. I believe that if we are hungry, if we come hungry tonight, that you will most certainly fill us. But if we allow ourselves to be distracted and not tune in, um, Lord, then we might miss what you have for us. And so I pray you give us a spiritual discipline. To tune in to the message you have for us tonight, I pray you give me power to preach, share these wonderful truths from your word, and challenge our hearts in a very deep way. Help us to grow uh, in these areas, in practicing these truths. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now in this text, God really teaches us what our responsibility is to people. Um, I've entitled the message tonight, People 101. Okay? If I was going to teach a college class on how to, how to deal with people, this text would most certainly be a part of the teaching. So very practical and wonderful instruction is given to us here about how to deal with people. Now, how many of you would describe yourselves as a people person? You're a people person. All right. Wow. There's not as many as I thought. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, there's two kinds of people in the world, in case you didn't know. There's the people people and there's the non-people people. Okay. Uh, the people people love to be around people, all right? Uh, they usually have bubbly personalities. They're fun to be around. Uh, they love being in a crowd. It doesn't bother them coming to church or really doing anything. In fact, what bothers them is being alone. They want to go find some people. Um, those are the people people. 
I think they're very strange people, by the way, okay? I'm not a people people. You, I should be probably a pastor, but I'm not a people people, okay? Uh, the other people are the non-people people. We don't need to be around people. In fact, sometimes we really like being alone. And uh, sometimes we really enjoy solitude. Um, we don't really need to be around people. Uh, I once had a non-people person tell me this. They said, I used to be a people person, but then people ruined that for me, okay? <laughs> Um, and so that might be where some of you are at. Maybe you used to be there and you just kind of lost it. And I tell you this, in all seriousness, regardless of what your personality is, in the body of Christ, God calls all of us to be a people person. Now that may come as a surprise to you. But God calls all of us to be a people person within the body of Christ. And we have the tendency in American culture to want to isolate ourselves or to do life um, outside of these walls on our own. Like we come in for our once a week gathering and we say hi to each other and okay, I've, I've done my duty uh, to my church and I'm just going to go be me and do what I want to do. And we have this idea in American Christianity that we just do this church thing once a week. We see these people once a week and then we go off and live our life and have our friends and have our hobbies and do all those other things and we come back. And we never really get to know anybody. Uh, it, it's really a problem because it's so different from what the Bible actually describes the local church is supposed to be. Because God's plan for us is not to be isolated from us, but to be in, uh, isolated from each other, I should say, but to be intimately connected to each other, to know each other. To fellowship with each other, to grow with each other, to challenge each other, to even admonish each other, as we're going to look at in the scriptures here tonight. Now, Wearsby, in his commentary, he noted something about the church called body life. And I thought it was very interesting. It's talked about all throughout the New Testament. But it is this. It is the ministry of each Christian to the others. And this is what he says about this body life. He says, just as the various members of the human body minister to each other to maintain health and life, so should the members of the body of Christ. We should minister to each other to be able to maintain health and life. And so as members of Christ's body, we need to learn to minister to each other. It's something that God created us in Christ Jesus and placed us within a local church to be able to do. It's a great responsibility that God has given to us. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 is in your notes. It says, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I want you to listen to me. It's not just the pastor's responsibility to minister to the body. So last week we did look at that. And that is important. And that is something that's in the scripture. Most certainly a pastor should. Not, uh, not uh, uh, saying that is not so, but what I am conveying is that there is a common misconception, especially in American Christianity, that, well, that's what we pay you to do. But we miss the beauty of what the church is supposed to be. No, we are all supposed to be members one of another, and we're supposed to minister to the needs of each other. And if one member's hurting, then all the other members are going to come to support it. If one member's doing well, all the other members are going to come and encourage it and celebrate with it. Uh, just like the human body would, would work, so uh, we as the body of Christ are supposed to work. Now in our text, look at verse number 14 again. At the beginning it says, now we exhort you. And who does it say? Brethren. brethren. This entreaty, this exhortation is for all the brethren. For every single member of the body of Christ. That's you, that's me, that's everybody who has been saved. Uh, I thought it was interesting what Barnes noted on this. He said one reason why there is so little piety in the church and why so many professors of religion go astray is that uh, the, 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 uh, in mass, church members feel no responsibility on this subject. Of ministering to each other. We completely preclude our responsibility. We like to just say, well, we go about our lives and we do our things independent of each other because we're very American and our culture. When God has created us to function together as a body. So I dare say we need to hear the exhortation that the scripture has for us tonight about how we are to minister to each other as the body of Christ in particular. 
And so in this text, God gives us five ways every believer must minister to others. And I want us to notice these tonight. First, you can write this down, warn the wanderer. First, God calls us to warn the wanderer. If you look at verse number 14 with me, the Bible says this. It says, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Warn them that are unruly. Can you say that out loud with me? Warn them that are unruly. God expects you to be willing to warn those who are wandering out of the way. Well, that's all of us. If God places another brother or sister in Christ in your path, and you sense by the direction of the Holy Spirit that they're drifting, you have a spiritual responsibility as a part of the body to step in their path and say, hey, I don't think you're going in the right direction. That's literally what the Bible's talking about here. Warn them that are unruly. The word warn, uh, the nepheteo is the Greek uh, word that is translated from. It, it means to admonish. And it, it, it is the same word that back in verse number 12 um, is, is, is listed about what the pastor is supposed to do towards people. Uh, it's translated as admonish in verse 12. And now here again we see the same word translated as warn. Warn, admonish, they essentially mean the same thing. And so what you are supposed to be doing as a member of the body is you're supposed to be looking out for your brothers and sisters. Uh, this, this life that we're living is often described as a battle. And we are called as warriors in this battle to be watching each other's backs. To be looking out for each other. The Bible tells us about this when the Bible mentions our spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, the end of that list of our spiritual armor, it says that we're to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And then notice this. It says to watch thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. One of the most vital aspects of our spiritual armor. I like to call it our walkie-talkie ministry, okay? All right? Sometimes the most vital aspect of our, of our ministry is being willing to to call each other up and say, watch out. I see something happening right behind you that you don't see. I see some danger coming your way that you may not see. I see where that relationship is heading. I see where that worldly affection is taking you, and it's not a good place, and so I'm going to warn you. Don't go that way. Don't keep walking that direction because that's not the way that God has called us to go. This is something God calls all of us to be involved in. I'll just say this. Uh, this is just for free. Uh, I don't believe that God has called us to warning ministry on Facebook, okay? <laughs> Call them. Talk to them to their face. Passive, aggressive, anything is not godly, all right? Um, you're not doing warning ministry by uh, publicizing somebody's issues online. Um, and so that is a, a secondary issue, but an important issue nonetheless. I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, but we live in that society today. So warning ministry is something that's done person to person, life to life. Uh, now, who are we supposed to warn? Who are the type of people we're supposed to warn? Well, it says to warn the unruly, those that are unruly. The phrase here is uh, atakros, and it literally speaks of those who are dis disorderly or those who are out of line. Uh, in Greek society, atakros was a word that they would use to describe someone who didn't show up to work. Okay, uh, attack Ross was was also a word they would use to describe a soldier who got out of line and did not did not stay in line. All right? He got out of order. Uh, that's that's the unruly, the disorderly, those who have gotten out of line. And from time to time, we're going to have brethren as a part of this body who get out of line spiritually. They're not living the way that God has clearly commanded them to live. And when this happens, the Bible says it is your responsibility and my responsibility to call them out on it and challenge them to get back in line. Matthew 18 this is one of the early principles Jesus taught that, that, that if, you have, if you have an issue with somebody, you're to go to them one-on-one -on -one and try to make it right first. Um, Galatians 6.1. It says, brethren, if a, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. This is important ministry for us as the church. It's all of our responsibility to each other. And so the first truth that we see here is that we are to warn the wandering. And there is such an important, uh, important point here. Now I'll say this before we move on. 
when the body of Christ refuses to do what the Bible is telling us to do here, I'll say it only leads to confusion and trouble. And I like what Barnes noted on this. He said, it is not difficult in an army when soldiers uh, get out of line or leave their places in rank to see that not much can be accomplished in that state of confusion. And many a church is like an army where half of the soldiers are out of line and where not half of them could be depended on for efficient service or to wage a campaign. Now, isn't that convicting? We're so, sometimes we get in a place where we're soldiers out of line in the spiritual battle that God's called us to march in. And when someone gets out of line, it's our spiritual duty and love to go to them and say, hey, that's not the way that Christ has called us to walk. Warn the wanderers. You're not helping them by ignoring the fact that they're wandering. You're not helping them. You're not being more loving to them by watching them go down a path that's going to destroy their life. In fact, the loving thing to do is to warn them in love. That's what God's called us to do. And so understand the first truth, and how we're supposed to treat others in the body, is to uh, warn, the one, warn the wanderer. Number two, note this down, then we're to console the coward. We're to console the cowardly. Um, the Bible puts it this way in verse 14. The next principle there is to comfort the feeble-minded. All right, comfort the feeble-minded. Now, I'm sure that some of you are thinking of someone in this room as being, they look, they look like they're very, very feeble-minded, okay? Uh, we'll, just, we'll define what that means uh, in just a minute. What the Bible is essentially telling us here is that God expects you to comfort those who are discouraged or afraid. Uh, the word comfort here is not the typical word that we see used in the New Testament for comfort. Um, uh, parakaleo is often the word used for comfort. Uh, this is a different word. It's parabatheo. Uh, and it, it, it literally means to speak to one in order to calm him or to console him. Uh, I, I, it's Mother's Day, so I, as I was studying this this week, I thought, you know what, that's a lot like what a mother does when, 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 uh, when their child gets all riled up about something or scared about something. Uh, they just sit them on their lap and they comfort them and console them until they calm back down. Uh, I, I love uh, the, the etymology of this, of this word. Uh, it, it, it comes from two Greek root words, uh, para, which means near, and muthos, which means speech. And so literally, if you just literally take the word for what it means, it means near speech. Um, and and that's, that's, that's what comfort is. It's near speech. The idea is you must be close enough for them to hear you speak. Um, that's the only way you can give this kind of comfort the Bible's describing here. Now, hey, you can criticize from a distance. That's really easy. You can talk about them and, well, I don't know why they're so riled up about this. You can criticize very easily from a distance, but you must be near to them to console them. You must be near to them to bring the comfort the Bible's describing here. And I, I have learned this, if I've learned anything as a pastor, that people, more than, more than they need to hear what I have to say, when they become feeble-minded, they need for me to be there with them when they're scared. When they're when they get to the place where they're discouraged. Sometimes I just need to be there and I don't even have to say anything. Just the fact that someone's there and someone cares, it brings the comfort of God to their souls. This is what God has called us to do as believers. And the, the person the Bible says we are to do this for are the feeble-minded. So what is feeble-minded? Well, it comes from a Greek word that literally means little-souled. Okay. Uh, little sold. It carries the idea of being discouraged or worried or, or faint hearted. Or we could put it this way someone who's just ready to quit. They're just ready to quit. With whatever it is they're going through, they're just ready to quit. And every church is full of people who get discouraged, who, who decide, I, I just I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And, and all they sometimes need is for another believer, mind you. Not always the pastor. In fact, not even most of the time the pastor. All they need is for another believer to come along and speak a good word to them. Right. I mean, to get near to them and notice, hey, you look a little down. Are you okay? Let me tell you something that the Bible says that can encourage you. A good word can change someone's life, can change someone's attitude, can change someone's perspective. Look in your notes at Proverbs 12 and verse 25. It says, heaviness in the heart of a man makes it stoop, but a good word 
makes it glad. Boy, can I encourage you, church? Use your language. Use your speech to build people up every opportunity that you get. To encourage people. To put life into people. Um, that's what God has called us to do. To use our speech to edify. To put strength in people. If someone is discouraged, the best thing you can do for them is encourage them. And that means to put strength in them. Right? To give them the truth of God's word that will strengthen their soul. And so God has called us as the church to warn the wanderers. He has called us as the church to console the cowardly. Here's the third truth I want you to know. And that, is, that is that he's called us to hold up the helpless. To hold up the helpless. The third principle, verse 14, that we see is that we are to support who? The weak. All right, let's say that together. Support the weak. God expects you to be there to hold up those people who are feeble. To hold up the people. The feeble. Uh, support, it's a word that, that, that speaks of holding on to someone. Okay? Uh, it carries the idea of uh, keeping uh, yourself directly beside someone to help to carry their weight. Now, I love to play basketball. Um, I played many sports. Basketball is one I always go back to. And many times... I've been the one that has rolled my ankle, or I've watched somebody else roll their ankle, or, or, pull, or, or pull their ACL or the MCL, and, and inevitably what happens is they can't walk. So what do you got to do? You go over to them, usually one or two guys will stand beside them, and they'll put their arms around them. What are they doing? They're holding their weight and helping them be able to walk because they're too weak to be able to walk on their own. That's the picture of support. That's spiritually what God has called us to do for people who are weak, spiritually speaking. We're to hold them up. We're to carry their weight for them. And let me tell you, you can't give someone this kind of support from far away. In order to give someone this kind of support, you've got to be close to them. And that's literally what the word support, uh, the idea of the word support carries. It's not just the support of, uh, from, from a distance, a text message, I'm praying for you. But it's a, it's a support that goes to the person, picks up their burden, and walks with them down the pathway that they're going down. I was studying this passage of scripture this week. The Lord so convicted my heart. I just got back from uh, going to be with uh, Jerry and Murda. And, uh, uh, and I got back, and, and lo and behold, there was another one of our families, uh, the Creech family, that got flown out to Colorado Springs. And I just, just got off the phone with Matt. And I was coming to study this principle right here. Support the weak. And boy, that's where they're at right now. They're really struggling. They're really uh, just, just confused and wondering uh, about where God has them right now. And the Lord just convicted my heart because I wasn't there. And so I started praying, Lord, do you want me to jump back in the car and drive to Colorado Springs? Is that where I need to be? Is that what you're telling me? And as I was thinking about it, it was the neatest thing. I thought the Lord brought T. Bradshaw to my mind. He's a truck driver. And I thought, well, why did the Lord do that? And I thought, well, maybe he's on, maybe he's close by. And so I just called him. And I asked Brother Teague if, uh, where he was at. He said he, said he was in Kansas, I believe. And, and I asked him where he, uh, what direction he was taking home. And I just asked him if he would be willing to go by and visit the Creech family. Why? To support the weak. To not just say I'm praying for you, but to come in person and say, let me help you bear this burden. And I'm so thankful that he was willing uh, to follow the leadership of the Lord. And uh, we went as far as we could with that. With the team. Um, and I'm thankful for your willingness to do that. But that's what the Bible is talking about. To be willing to pick yourself up and to go where they're at. And I'll be honest, there's been many times as a pastor, I've gotten that 1 a.m. phone call. Where someone says, Pastor, we're going to the hospital. And then I'm waiting and I know it's coming. You know what they're going to say? Will you come? And I'll be honest. At 1 a.m.? That's not what I'm thinking. Okay? What I'm thinking is, I'll pray for you as I go back to sleep. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. But I'm telling you, there's just something that, about what God's called us to do. Get up off of your hind end and go to that person and help bear their burden. Think of it as a person who's injured. They can't make it out on their own. You've got to help bear the weight of what it is that they are going through. Now, the person the Bible says we're supposed to support is the weak. 
This isn't talking about spiritual weakness. I'm sorry, it's not talking about physical weakness. It's talking about a spiritual weakness. Uh, uh, Leon Morris said, The weak should feel that they are not alone, and strong Christians should hold on to them and give them the support that they require in order to be able to make it through. Warren Rearsby said, We must take hold of these weaker brothers and help them stand and walk in the Lord. That's what God has called us to do. So church, these are three principles God gives us about our responsibility to each other. We're to warn the wanderers, and we're to console uh, the cowardly, and we're to hold up the helpless. The last two principles I'm just going to cover very briefly here. The narrative switches a little bit. These last two principles are not just for how we're supposed to treat the brethren, but it's those within and those without the church. Look in your Bibles at verse, the end of verse 15. Uh, for context here, at the end of verse 15, these principles, it says, were to do both among yourselves and to who? All men. All men. So it's both those in the church and outside the church. This last principle, verse 14, and all of verse 15 is all-encompassing for believers and unbelievers. The Lord tells us how we're supposed to treat them. And so number four, uh, note this down, put up with people. That's pretty simple, right? Enough said, right? Well, let's look at what the Bible actually says here. Look at the end of verse 14, last line of verse 14. It says, be patient toward all men. Let's say that out loud together. Be patient toward all men. God expects you to be patient with every person that you meet. Wow. That's a mouthful. God expects you to be patient with every single person that you meet. Now, I heard the story about a farm boy who was traveling with a load of corn in his wagon, and wouldn't you know it, as they were driving down the way with his horse, the wagon overturned. And his neighbor saw the thing happen and he, uh, from a distance, and he came out and uh, went out to try to encourage the boy. And when he came out to encourage the boy, he said, Now, I saw that your wagon overturned. I know you're probably really discouraged. Why don't you just leave it there? And you come on to my house, and we'll feed you some dinner. And the boy said, no, I can't do that. I don't think my, I think my Paul would be, would be very happy with me if I did that. And the man said, now, son, don't worry about it. I know you're Paul, and he's, he's going to be fine with this. You just come on out. We want to encourage you. You come on out. We'll feed you some dinner, and then we'll come back and deal with your overturned wagon. And the boy said, no, I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think my Paul would like this at all. But the, boy, the, the, the man kept on encouraging the young boy, and the, and the boy said, okay, I'll come, but I don't think my Paul's going to like this. And so they went, and they enjoyed a great meal, and they got done with the meal. And uh, uh, they, they asked the young boy, did you enjoy your meal? And he said, yeah, absolutely, I enjoyed this, but I still don't think my Paul's going to be very happy with this. And uh, the man looked at the boy, and he said, well, I, I know your Paul. Uh, I'll, I'll go talk to him. Where's your Paul at right now? And he said, he's under the wagon. Yeah, that's the wagon. All right. So... Uh, patience. Sometimes we need lots of patience to endure uh, some of the things that people uh, do for us in life. Uh, but the Bible says be patient. Be patient. It literally means to be of long spirit or to be of long heart, we could say. And uh, um, to not lose heart for the people that are in your life. That's one way we could put it. By the way, I'm thankful that God is long-suffering with me. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank God for all that he's put up with from me. And in the same way that God has been long-suffering with you, he calls you to be long-suffering towards others that he places into your life. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2, I believe this is in your notes, it says, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. God has told us to be long suffering towards each other. I say this being patient with each other is one of the truest acts of love. When you are patient with someone, it's because you love them with a God kind of love. Why? 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffers long. Love is patient, in other words, and is kind. If you truly love people, you'll learn to put up with them. 
right? Now, moms are very patient individuals, <coughs> most of the time, <laughs> uh, by the very nature of their calling. And I say impatience is easy. Patience is hard. And I will go so far as to say to be patient with people truly requires the enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God. Right. When you really struggle with being patient, right, you can't even go through McDonald's um, drive through without complaining <laughs> about how long it's taken, okay? We are Americans at heart. We want everything and we want it now. We, are very, we tend to be very impatient people. In order to be, have the kind of patience the Bible is telling us about, we need the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, the, the fruit of the Spirit is, among many other things, long-suffering. It's patience. As God's Spirit works in your life, He helps you to develop this kind of patience the Bible says that we're supposed to have towards all people. By the way, it's a little bit easier a lot of times to be patient with people within the body where we struggle with is people outside the body. The, the body all right? um, uh, uh, when, so when you're driving down the road tomorrow morning to work, remember Put up with people, okay? Um, you have a testimony for Christ uh, that you're bearing. And God had, this is how God's taught, taught us to deal with the people that's in our lives. That person who's in your workplace, with that family member who's lost and they get on your last nerve every time you get around them. Put up with people. Be patient. That's what God has told us to do. You need to pray to help, to ask God to help you to do it. Here's the last principle and we'll be done. Don't pay back, but pay forward. Don't pay back, but pay forward. For this, let's look at verse 15. The Bible says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Don't pay back. Let's just look at that first. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. See that. It's a, it's a phrase here in the scripture that, that literally talks about, let me make sure I get this definition right, uh, it means to take care or to be, uh, to be cautious, be careful about something here. Be careful that you don't retaliate, you don't render evil for evil. We have the tendency to want to pay people back. Remember one time years ago we had a staff member who uh, a prank was done to them. And he was so frustrated about this prank. Uh, he hated the thing that was done to him. Um, it was glitter. I don't like glitter either. But he had a very special hatred for glitter, okay? And I remember after he walked in, after this glitter was all over his office, he just came. He never did this. He just came into my office. He was so mad. And he said, I don't get back. I get even. <laughs> I don't know if he ever did that, but I, <laughs> I, I uh, turned a deaf ear to that because I knew he was very frustrated in the moment. Um, that's our tendency in our flesh. When someone does something to us, we want to get back at them. I struggle with this because even uh, as a pastor, it's a very normal thing for me to get a nasty email or a nasty text message or a nasty phone call from someone who's upset about something. Uh, anything from the color on the wall to things that are much more serious, okay? And I am a very sinful person, okay? And there's been many times where someone has sent me something like that. And I'm going to tell you something. I have come up with some doozies, okay? <laughs> and I've written them out. And boy, I'm looking at it, and my flesh is like, ooh, yeah, this is going to be good. And then the Holy Spirit says, erase every single word, Bruce. <laughs> because why? Don't retaliate, all right? Don't react. You need to act in the power of the Spirit. And God has told, told us how to, how to deal with people. Don't pay people back. Romans 12, 12, 19. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Trust the fate of other people who do you wrong into the hands of the Almighty Judge. You are not the judge. God is the judge. You do what God's called you to do and trust for God to take care of them in his time. Um, so don't pay back, but pay forward. The end of verse 15 says, instead of rendering evil for evil, ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Ever means at all times, always, ever follow. 
The word follow there means to pursue something eagerly, to make it your life's pursuit, all right? To make it your end goal, to make it your desire. Instead of retaliating against people, make it your goal to do good to people. In other words, to be kind to people. To do what is right by others in every scenario of your life, even if they don't do what is right for you. All right, now some of you probably heard, uh, heard the concept of paying something forward before. I, uh, I've had this happen many times. I'll be going through the drive through in town, or I'll be sitting at a restaurant, and, uh, and then I go, I go to pay at the window, or I go to pay at the desk when I'm getting ready to, to check out for meeting, and, and all of a sudden somebody has paid for my meal. All right? Uh, and it, it, it's really interesting when you go through the drive through because a lot of times um, uh, you see the person who's in front of you, and you're trying to figure out who was that person. And a lot of times it wasn't even the person who's right in front of you. It might have been the person who's two or three cars in front of you. And a lot of times you don't actually ever know who the person was. Um, and and uh, we've done this before, um, just randomly. Uh, uh, the Lord put it on your heart. We go to pay for a meal, and we'll just throw some extra money down and say, hey, I just want to pay this for for somebody else. Uh, let this take care of somebody else's meal, right? Uh, so that's the concept of paying something forward. And the idea here is you're just going, you're going ahead and sowing something that's good, even if someone else is not reacting the way that they're supposed to. You're sowing something that's good in someone else's life in hopes that God will use that uh, to have an impact on their hearts. But the truth of the matter is what God has called us to do is to do right by other people, regardless of whether or not they're going to do it to us. Very practical, these truths that we're looking at tonight. But this is how God has called us to treat one another as the body of Christ. Ephesians 4.32, be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And so God wants believers to learn how to minister to people. Both within this body, we have a responsibility towards each other to warn the wanderers, to console the cowardly and those who are struggling. We have a responsibility to support the weak. And within these walls and outside these walls, we also have some responsibilities to not retaliate, to be kind uh, to all the people that we encounter in our lives, and to put up with people, to be patient with people. So here's my last question for you. How are you doing? I studied these truths, this, I studied these truths all week, and I'm going to tell you something. The Lord tore me up in several areas where I need some help, uh, and I need to get my heart right with the Lord and back in line with what the Lord's teaching us here. And these are things that we continually need to be reminded of. All right? So now the Lord's reminded, of you, reminded you of this at this point. Where have you been struggling? Where do you need to re-surrender to the Lord and be right in your conduct towards the people God has placed in your life? I hope you're listening to what the Lord's saying tonight. And I hope you're willing to respond and do what the Lord's leading you. Uh, to be right in your conduct towards people. Because Jesus is coming. And until Jesus comes, we want to live on this earth the way that he's called us to. So that he will find us faithful when he comes. Amen. Amen.